Will you join me for our unison reading of Psalm 126? When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Their mouth was filled with laughter and their tongue with shouts of joy. Then it was said among nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us and we rejoiced. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the water courses in the Nejah. May those who sow in tears and reap shouts of joy, those who go out weeping, bear the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, carrying their sheaves. Today's Gospel reading is from the book of Matthew, and we are reading chapter 25, verses 31 through 46. The teachings in today's reading come in the final days of Jesus' life. Jesus had been speaking at the Temple of Jerusalem, where he criticized its leaders for, among other things, acting in their own self-interest rather than according to God's will. Jesus predicts the destruction of the temple as a metaphor for the end of time and foreshadows his own death and resurrection. Having moved on to the Mount of Olives, the disciples ask Jesus how they will know when the end is near and when he will come again. Jesus responds by issuing a series of apocalyptic warnings about what the end will be like and cautions the disciples to be vigilant until he returns. Underscoring his vigilance message with the parable of the ten bridesmaids, Jesus then uses the parable of the talents to instruct the disciples to be good stewards of his kingdom and to use their gifts wisely. In this morning's reading, Jesus concludes his teaching by describing the judgment that will occur upon his return. Hear now the word of the Lord. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You are accursed. Depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me, naked, and you did not give me clothing, sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it, for the one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Here ends the reading. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to Martin Luther King Sunday at Northfield Church. What an auspicious day to be speaking 
to salute the work of Dr. King in song and scripture, and to introduce our ministry to this wonderful congregation in the town in which we live. My name is Jeff Grant, and the title of today's sermon is Authentic. And I've received a lot of lessons in being authentic. That is, lessons not in talking about authenticity, but lessons in living an authentic life and speaking from an authentic place. Over the next 15 minutes or so, I'm going to do my best to be authentic. I'm going to tell you the story of how I was transformed from being a successful New York corporate attorney to becoming addicted to prescription painkillers, to surviving almost 14 months in a federal prison, to receiving my Master of Divinity from Union Theological Seminary in the city of New York, to becoming an inner city minister in Bridgeport, to founding with my wife Lynn a prison ministry that supports the families of white collar criminals and nonviolent criminals and their families. I have an admission to make up front. I'm a very flawed guy. Along with my legal and addiction issues, I have a lot of other issues that often prevent me from living and working a full day without collapsing. I suffer from bipolar depression. I have diabetes and kidneys problems. I have communication problems with my kids. And I'm old. <laughs> Perhaps you can relate to some of these issues. I don't know why Lynn married me, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> Let's start first with the issues that I had in today, writing today's sermon for Martin Luther King Day. When I was first asked to preach on this particular day about three or four months ago, I had a lot of ideas. I picked out special scriptures that you've heard today. I picked them out to interpret them. I researched deep into the life and ministry of Martin Luther King. And Lynn and I even went to see the new movie Selma about Dr. King and his ministry. It's a great movie, by the way. I tried to do all these things, but frankly, nothing authentic was coming. I was feeling dejected. And then last Sunday, we attended church right here at Northfield. And in his sermon, Reverend Bernard reminded me that God loves me just the way I am. And in the coffee hour after church, our great friend Jim Hodell, sitting in the fifth row over there, came over to me and told me that when I preached next week, that he couldn't wait to hear my story. My story, of course. My story is why I was asked to speak here today. My story is what's gotten me thus far. In order to preach on Martin Luther King Day or any day, all I have to do is be authentic and trust you with the story of who I am and why I care. In so doing, I hope and pray that by fully revealing my story to you in some small way, it helps you to have the courage and agency to reveal your own authentic story too. So here goes my story. My story began when I suffered a sports injury in 1992. I was a young, successful corporate and real estate lawyer with all the trappings of big house in Westchester County BMW, vacations to the Caribbean. Some of you probably can relate. Anyway, I was playing basketball with my biggest client when lightning struck and I ruptured my Achilles tendon. And in the course of rehabilitation from that injury, I got hooked on prescription painkillers. I never meant for it to happen, but it did. And over the next 10 years, I took them almost every day of my life. The problem with taking painkillers, at least for me, was that it was insidious. Day after day, little by little, they cut away at my soul and ate away at my judgment. If I'd had the ability to look back and look at my life from a distance and see it in a five or 10 year slice, I probably could have seen how different everything looked over those different time periods. The compromises I was making, the physical changes, the mood and behavior issues, the money problems. It probably would have been obvious, but I couldn't do that. Instead, day by day, the cumulative effect was imperceptible. I had no way of understanding that I was self-medicating my undiagnosed bipolar disorder. I was miserable. My weight had ballooned to 285 pounds. I was vomiting up blood from anxiety. I was spending way more money than I was making. And I was taking more and more painkillers. I stopped showing up for client meetings and my law firm was spinning out of control. One day, my office manager came up to me and told me that we had a problem. She told me that we're gonna, we weren't going to make payroll that week. 
How could that be possible? I had been in business as a lawyer for almost 20 years, and despite all the problems, all the madness, the business had grown to become one of the most successful law practices in Westchester County, something I still have no explanation for. But we were out of cash, and I could have done a lot of reasonable things. I could have called a friend. I could have called my bank. But my mind was reeling, and the drugs wouldn't let me focus, and that's when I made my deal with the devil. I told her to borrow the money from the firm's client escrow account. She asked me if I was sure that's what I wanted to do, and I told her to do it. And with two key strokes of a computer, my fate was sealed forever. I wound up borrowing and replacing client escrow funds a few more times, but the damage was really done the first time. And as these things go, there would be a grievance against me that started out over something small, but my client escrow records would be subpoenaed and I would start a three-year battle to retain my law license to defend against the defenseless. Racked with shame and guilt, my painkiller use escalated and I got really out of control. On September 11th, when I saw the plane hit the second tower, I went into sheer madness. It was as if the world stopped spinning. I couldn't think and I couldn't work. I started to lose clients and staff. I was in a pit of denial and I was looking for a way out. There were commercials on TV, and the radio for small business loans for businesses that had been adversely affected by the tragedy. And I called them and I described my problem. They told me that I qualified for a 9-11 loan, but even having qualified, I was just too desperate and too stoned. And I embellished my loan application just to make sure I got the loan. In a few weeks, I did get that loan, and I thought I was on track to save my law firm. But it didn't help, and within a few very short months, all the evidence had mounted and it became clear that I was going to lose my grievance case and I was going to be disbarred from the practice of law. One day in July 2002, I'd had enough. I had no more fight left in me. I couldn't take it anymore. I called my ethics attorney and told him to throw in the towel and resign my law license. That night, after my wife and kids went to sleep, I sat down in the big easy chair of the den in our house in Westchester and I tried to kill myself. I swallowed an entire bottle of painkillers, and I just wanted the pain and the madness to stop. I woke up a few days later in the acute care unit of Silver Hill Hospital in New Canaan, and there was no way of knowing that instead of my life ending, that my new life had begun. I made it through seven weeks of rehab and started doing, the, the, I started the long, arduous journey of a road back through recovery. I went to my first recovery meeting on, the night, on my first night out of Silver Hill, and at that meeting I did exactly as I was instructed to do. I raised my hand and said, my name is Jeff, I'm an alcoholic, and I need a sponsor. I met my first sponsor at my very first recovery meeting, and I've attended almost 9,000 meetings since then. I've never again touched another drink or a drug. I'm very proud to say that on August 10th of this year, God willing, I will celebrate my 13th sobriety anniversary. But of course, we already know that there was more to my story. And I did what any sane person would do when they lost their money and they had no job. I moved my family to Greenwich, Connecticut. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps the wealthiest community in the country. There I became a very involved member in recovery and took on a lot of responsibilities and commitments. After all, recovery had saved my life. Over the first year or two, with so much record to take care of, I had lost my career, my money, I lost our home in foreclosure, and my marriage was in shambles. But recovery was bed my bedrock, and I was staying sober. One morning when I had about 20 months of sobriety, I got a received a call from the FBI. The agent on the phone told me that there was a warrant out for my arrest in connection with the fraudulent statements I had made on my 9-11 loan. It had been four years since, and I was now sober, almost two years. I couldn't believe that anybody was looking at that loan. One of the gifts that I was of this, one of the gifts that I received was that I was able to face this all as a sober man and be there for my family, my community, and myself sober. I was sentenced to 18 months in federal prison. For those of you who don't know how the designation process works in a federal prison system, Basically, on the day that your name comes up, you're designated by your security level, lowest to highest. 
I had a security level of zero. So I could have been designated to a camp anywhere within 500 miles of our home in Greenwich. But on the day I was designated, there were no beds available in camps in this area. So I was designated to a low security prison. And that's where I went. On Easter Sunday of 2006, I reported to Allenwood Low Security Corrections Institution in White Deer, Pennsylvania, and soon found out that inside there would be one former lawyer, that's me, two former doctors, five former stockbrokers, and 1,500 drug dealers. This was real prison, and it, would be, and it would be home for me for the next 13 and a half months. I was released from prison in 2007 and had to do a stint in a halfway house in Hartford, home detention, and then three years of federal probation. I also had a court-ordered drug and alcohol counselor. It was this counselor, a former priest, Catholic priest, turned drug counselor who had recommended to me that I rebuild my life through volunteerism. I called my old rehab, Silver Hill Hospital, and asked him if I could come interview for a volunteer position, and they told me to come over that day. We sat and talked for almost two hours, and importantly, I fully disclosed everything that had happened to me in the last few years. They asked me to fill out an application and told me they were going to do a background check, and I was nervous. I figured that if my own rehab wouldn't take me for a volunteer job, who in the world would ever let me work for them? I didn't have to wait long, though. Two hours later, my phone rang, and I was a recovery volunteer for Silver Hill Hospital. This led me next to becoming a volunteer house manager at Liberation House in downtown Stamford, and then to Family Reentry, a nonprofit serving the ex-offender communities in Bridgeport and New Haven, Connecticut. This was the first organization that asked me to serve on its board of directors. My first project with the Family Reentry was with my girlfriend, now my wife, Lynn. We worked with Family Reentry ex-offenders and converted a blighted inner city block in Bridgeport into the largest privately owned public use parking garden in the state of Connecticut. It's an oasis and it completely revitalized that neighborhood. All this time we were living in Greenwich and attending recovery meetings and I became known as the prison guy. I was sharing about going to prison, surviving prison and staying sober through the entire experience. Soon hedge fund guys and others who had white collar legal problems were seeking me out and over those 10 years that I attended recovery in Greenwich, I must have met with and counseled over 100 guys, all in various stages of going to and coming back from prison. It was an eye-opening experience. I had no idea that it was gonna turn into a ministry. I was just putting one foot in front of the other. I went to a reverend in the church that we were attending in Greenwich, and I told him that I was searching for something more meaningful. He recommended that I apply to Union Theological Seminary in New York City. I told them I thought it was a little crazy. For one, I'm a Jew. Next, with my story, how could I ever get accepted to the preeminent urban seminary in the world? But he told me that seminaries are in the redemption business and that I should apply. And I did. And I was accepted to Union Theological Seminary and went to school there for three years. In April 2011, I was baptized with water that was brought back to me by a friend from the River Jordan, and in May 2012, I earned a Master of Divinity from Union Theological Seminary with a focus in Christian social ethics. A few months later, while I was still working with white collar families in Greenwich and doing reentry work in Bridgeport, I accepted an offer from the First Baptist Church of Bridgeport for Lynn and I to start a prison ministry at the church. You have no idea how blessed we felt to have come from where we came from and to have a life of service in a community where we could really make a difference and where they could make a profound difference in us. I started to blog about the experience of working in the hood during the day and with white collars in the evening when lightning struck again. I received a call from a reporter at a hedge fund magazine who had read my blog, and he asked me if I was the minister to hedge fund guys. He asked if he could do an interview, and I told him that he could on one condition, that the story is about the creation of a new form of ministry, an authentic ministry, that offers a safe space to people in our communities who are suffering in silence to share their stories and find support. It's from this place of authenticity we can bring together suffering people from affluent 
and inner city communities to communicate authentically with one another and to learn from one another. What resulted was a sensitive and powerful interview that caught the attention of a lot of people. The Progressive Prison Project and the Innocent Spouse and Children Project are the first ministries in the United States created to support the families of people accused or convicted of white collar and other nonviolent crimes. These families are everywhere around us. They're in our little town of Weston, suffering in silence. They receive so little empathy and compassion and are so easy to other by a world that is all too eager to believe the next sensationalized headline and to ignore the human side. So many incredible things have happened in our journeys uh, to, for us since then. Among them, I was invited to join the Board of Directors of Community Partners in Action in Hartford. I was asked to join the editorial board of the new book, The Justice Imperative, about the state of criminal justice here in Connecticut and in our country. And we moved from Greenwich to our new home in this lovely town in Weston, and we started to attend this church regularly. Lynn and, I, Lynn and I now split our time doing inner city prison ministry and ministering to white collar people and families. The wives and children are innocents of situations not their doing, in situations where they have often not been independently represented, in which husbands and fathers have gone to prison, often leading, leaving them penniless, homeless, and shunned by their communities. For these mothers and children, we have assembled teams of ministers, advocates, lawyers, counselors, and other professionals to protect them and get them safely through to a new life in a new family dynamic on the other side of prison. As I see it, the biggest tragedy of all about white collar and nonviolent crime is not how big the matter is or how sensationalized the headlines. It is in our failure to see it as an authentic human story with real people, real brokenness, and real families left behind. Thank you for this opportunity to be authentic and to share with you my story. May God bless you and keep you always. Amen.